Okay, welcome to uh, CSD 3205. Um, this is lecture 9, um, where I'm going to cover web scraping. So as you know, in Coursework 1, you have to build a price comparison website or similar kind of website. And this term, um, the data for your project is going to come from third-party websites. I'm going to explain how you can get that data using web scraping. So many websites are based on data from other websites, right? I mean, Google being a prime example. But we've also, but we've also got things like property search websites, price comparison websites, um, and so on and so forth. I showed you Price Runner. I showed you um, whatever it's called, EDLO, and there's quite a few of them out there. They're pulling data from other websites and then, and then displaying that data within their own website. And generally how this works is the data is downloaded from the third-party website, stored in a database, and then displayed in the third, in the you know in the in your own website, whatever, or in, within an app sometimes as well. Now, what I'm not talking about here is embedded content. So here we can uh, you know a little example of you know Dartmouth class of 1963, where you've got a web page, and then within this web page you've got like a sort of frame something like that, and then you've got you know probably something a bit more sophisticated these days, and then you've got the uh, the the data from Twitter, the sort of tweets of the class of 63, I suppose being sort of embedded or placed within the within the web page here. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about a sort of much sort of deeper level at which we're actually pulling the data and putting it in a database and then re sort of formatting it and putting it in your own website. So I'm not covering embedded content. And I'm also not covering uh, data from web services this term. So with web services, um, you know, uh, some websites make their data available in a sort of computer friendly format. So, you know, they might make their, their data from their website available in XML. That used to be popular. Today, most web services provide data in JSON. And you're going to build your own JSON web service, um, which I'm going to explain in the next lecture. So sometimes you provide the data for free or sometimes you provide it for a fee. Um, and we're going to cover data from web services, how you get data from web services. I'm going to cover that next term because next term you're going to get numerical data from web services and like use that to make predictions. Um, this term, um, you're, you're going to build your own web service, but I'm not going to explain how you get data from web services. So this little web surf example, right? You've seen lots of this kind of stuff. You go to that URL with your own access key, if it's like a paid thing or something you have to sign up for, and then you get a bunch of data in JSON format that you can then manipulate very easily using a computer. Now, another way you can get data on the web is by scraping it from uh, web pages. So web pages are written in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. The key thing about web pages is that they're designed to be read by humans and not designed to be accessed by computers. And because they're designed to look pretty and they're often redesigned, um, the format will change all the time. So, you know, the designers one day might decide that one kind of set of class names is good for them and then they design the page in a particular way. But then next Tuesday or whatever, um, they might change the look and f look of the website, change all the class names, and the code that you wrote to pull the data one day will become useless the next day. And sometimes web pages don't like you pulling their data, and they might I'll explain, give you some warnings about that at the end of this lecture. But sometimes they just want to make it difficult for you, or because they um, you know they're written in a way that's very heavy on JavaScript. So sometimes um, you know they can either obscure their data using JavaScript or they can um, or they just have a load of content dynamic content that makes it hard to scrape web pages and I'll come to some of this uh, a little bit later in the lecture so I'll just give you a little example so typically um, commercial uh, sort of big companies website will have a lot a lot a lot of you know very complicated HTML and CSS stitched together from you know many different sources and sort of put together in the page a bit like you know as I introduced you to the e-commerce website uh, in the last last year so here we've got the website at the top here and then you've got all the complicated kind of HTML CSS or whatever and within that HTML and CSS is the data that you want so the whole process of getting data from web pages is figuring out how to fish out the right bits of data that you want um, from all this HTML and CSS that, that you get um, in, the, in the web page so I'm going to start with a couple of little bits of revision on HTTP and CSS selectors. Then I'll explain how you can use JSOOP um, to extract different bits of data from a, a simple HTML examples I've, I've put together. And then I'll give you the sort of bigger picture about how you actually scrape web pages, you know, directly from the URL using JSOOP. And finally, at the end of the lecture, I want to give you some warnings because there are some legal issues related to the scraping of data from websites. 
So just a little bit of revision on HTTP. So you should be super familiar with HTTP by now, but just to refresh it in your memory. So it's the protocol used to communicate on the World Wide Web. Originally developed to exchange HTML pages, um, but now used to transfer data in other formats, you know, XML, JSON, so on and so forth. So the general way this works is you have a request, which is formatted in a specific HTTP way. And so, it's, you know, you're specifying the, the HTTP method, the sort of URL or page or, you know, resource or whatever you want to access. And that's kind of where you want to get that resource from. And then you have the response, which has like a bunch of sort of server and, you know, mostly server related data here. Um, <clears throat> so the response code, you know, whether it's okay or not, blah, blah, blah. And so those are the headers there, which are used to kind of control the interaction. And then you have the body which in the case of a get method, get request is typically empty. And then the body that's returned from a get request in response to a get request, you know, we'll have the page or maybe we've got an image or JSON or XML kind of here. But it might be the other way around. We might have a post request here, um, in which case we're gonna maybe put some parameters of some kind if we're logging in or something. And then with a post, the body will have something. And then the response usually will have something but doesn't necessarily have to have something. The response could just be okay if we posted some stuff with a get with a post HTTP request. So again, um, as you know, there's sort of four key methods. We've got get, post, put, and delete. Um, and there's other ones as well, like head and trace and the rest of it. And that's in the sort of uh, header of the request. Now, when you're usually when you're doing HTTP interactions, it's your browser is acting as the client and sending HTTP requests to the server to get the data and post data as you interact with the GUI. So you're interacting with the graphical interface of the browser and behind the scenes, the browser's doing all the stuff about, you know, getting and posting with HTTP. You have though, um, some of you, most of you I hope, um, used Ajax, where you're using HTTP, sending HTTP requests with uh, using JavaScript from within the browser. Now with web scraping, you're actually using a completely separate program or library to send these HTTP requests. And that lets you um, send and receive data from web servers without using a browser. So if we're going to forget about Chrome or the GUI or any of that, we're just going to be able to write code that can send HTTP requests and then extract the data from the HTML that's returned by those HTTP requests. So in Java, we've got a couple of choices. So as you know, we're trying to consolidate your knowledge of Java. So we're going to use Java for this part of the coursework. Um, and so we got uh, in Java, you could use the Apache HTTP client um, which you can get there, or JSOUP. So the Apache HTTP client is just sort of bare bones HTTP uh, client um, that will let you send HTTP requests and then you'll get back like the con, then you can process the body that's returned um, by the request um, in whatever way you want, you know, using JSON simple or, you know, some other, some other library. It's not a good choice um, if you're processing HTML because you're gonna to have to do all the work of writing your own HTML parser, which is gonna take an enormous amount of effort. So JSOUP is a much better choice for web scraping because it will also do the, it'll do the HTTP stuff for you, but it also contains some very sophisticated methods for working your way through the document object model or applying CSS selectors to the data that's returned so you can pick out exactly the data that you want. So JSOUP's, you know, the right choice um, for doing the web scraping stuff in Java, I think. There may be other libraries out there I'm not aware of. There's other ones you may, may have heard of. So Python has this beautiful soup library that's quite famous. Um, and Node.js, you can use Cheerio, but in this piece of coursework, because I'm trying to teach you all these enterprise Java tools, I want you to use, you know, a Java tool, and therefore JSOUP be the, be the obvious one to try. I strongly recommend against doing any kind of complex string processing on HTML documents, just use JSOUP for that. So I don't recommend H Apache HTTP client. We might use that next term, I haven't quite decided yet. Okay, so the second bit of revision uh, uh, going back to last year is uh, CSS selectors, because they're gonna play an important role in how we actually pick out the data we want um, from the web pages. So with JSOUP, we can use two methods for getting out the data that we need. Um, we can do this uh, traversal of the document object model. We can sort of hop sort of up and down the tree of the document object model, because it's a tree structure, if you remember. And that's kind of complicated and, you know, a bit of a nightmare, frankly. And, I and with a page that's, you know, hundreds of lines of HTML, um, you probably don't want to use a document object model method. Much easier, and this will usually work, is to use CSS selectors, and then you can just pick out a bit of data, and then maybe you've got to run a couple of CSS selectors, you know, in a row, as I'll show you, um, but in general, that's going to be easier um, than using document object model traversal. So as you remember, I hope from last year, CSS selectors are rules 
that let you select elements in an HTML document. Treat them as case sensitive, you know, uh, they may or may not work if they are or not case sensitive, particularly the class names, but just treat them as case sensitive, then you'll be alright. So, you know, you'll remember all these, right? That's like selecting all the elements on the page, or then we got like we can select the individual tags. We can select, like, we can do sort of document relate object model relationships. So, this is like anchor elements, the children of the list element. We can do anchor elements that are inside a paragraph element. The first paragraph element after a header, um, the sort of siblings, they're at the same level of the tree. And then, so these are all it's a little bit complicated and not always that useful. The ones that are really useful are class. We can select, we can pick out uh, the elements that are, that are styled with a particular class. We can even pick out the paragraphs that are styled with a note class here. Um, and, you know, the easiest one of all, just picking them out by the ID, um, just using the hashtag there. So I'll give you a little demo, just to sort of refresh your memory. So we go to my selected demo here, which is hopefully still connected to brackets. Um, Okay, so if we delete that and save it, yes, it's still connected. Okay, it's good, great. So I've got a very simple page here, just to refresh your memory, really. So here we've got our sort of uh, style, inline st in internal style sheets and all that. And then we've got three HTML elements. We've got a header, style with my class, paragraph with my class, and a div with my div. Okay, so it's pretty simple stuff. So if we do, and this element here is just styling whatever element I'm picking out, it's giving it a background color of red. So if we do body and save it, then it makes the whole body background red. And then if we do, you know, if we pick out H1, we can pick out elements by the tag name. So again, we're picking out the header there, or we could pick out by the ID. So we just use a hash, uh, my div. Um, then we're going to pick out, you know, the div. And we can pick out all the my class styles. Right, or we can, and we can also pick out, you know, the paragraph that's styled with my class. Now, in this super simple example, obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's dead easy to pick out the bits we need, but if you imagine the sort of super complex, massive HTML files you're going to get from uh, any kind of commercial company, um, then you're going to have to start getting very precise and quite good at figuring out these H uh, CSS selectors. Right, so now I've given you the a little bit of background revision stuff. Um, we can now go into um, how we actually pass HTML with JSOUP. So, JSOUP's a library designed for web scraping. That's why it makes sense to use JSOUP um, for the web scraping. So we can download the web pages. So that does the work of downloading the web pages using HTTP. And as I said, it can traverse the document object model, or we can use these CSS selectors to extract data. So just to give you a little bit of an example um, to start off, so I'm going to give you three examples now just to sort of show you how it works. These are sort of pages that are included within the example code, so you can have a little bit of a look at them as well and see how it all works. So the first example, very simple HTML page. We want to extract um, this particular uh, piece of data, these two pieces of data here. And as you can see, we've got the divs um, have specific IDs, so it's going to be very, very easy um, using CSS selectors to pick out these bits of data with these IDs. So in JSOUP, we're doing it in the following way. So in this case, we're reading from a file, and I'll show you later how to read from a URL, which is a little bit different. So we get there, so we read from the file here, and then we pass, pass, JSOUP will pass that file for us. And then all we do is, and when we pass the part, when JSOUP passes the document or URL or whatever, it will return a document here, which is a bit like the sort of um, document object model. And then JSOUP can then run different selector statements or document traversal, if you want, um, on that document object model. So we can do doc select div one here. So then this will return um, a set of one or more elements um, that are uh, that have the ID of div one. It should be sing single element, but this is typically, uh, I think, a, a list, something like that, Java list. And then because it's only one element, we can just do div one dot text. So div one dot text will return any text that's inside that div elements that, that's returned by the selection statement. If we did div1.html, it would return the HTML that's inside that particular div. Um, but in this case, div1.txt makes sense, and this is giving us test data one here. And then if we wanted to get div2, we can do um, a different kind of selection statement, because it also supports the sort of ones we can use in JavaScript. So here, select is easiest, right? But if we really wanted to, we could do document.getElementById, div2, and then that'll return div2, and then we can output div2 text. But generally, I think the selection stuff is 
a lot better. So here we've got another example. Here in this case you've got different classes. Now remember, with classes, you're going to have the problem that whereas an ID, in this case an ID, is going to usually is only applied to a single element within the page. That makes it very nice and precise. But commercial websites don't really use IDs that much, as far as I can see. They usually they tend to use classes, particularly when you're doing your scraping for your price comparison website. They use classes, um, and then so the class. The problem with using classes is you've got to figure out which there may be a unique class that will pick out the data you need, or it may be the case that they use that class in several parts of the page, and therefore you've got to do a bit more processing to figure out to pick out you know the element that has that class within a and as well as the context in which that element occurs. So in this case, I'll show you how to pull out by by uh, sorry for the confusing. Uh, show I'll show you how to pull out the class, but also how to pull out select by elements names, which should be super obvious by now given all the background I've given you on CSS selectors. So again we just run, so we've got the document already, we just run the select statement and this is h1 football info that will turn all of the h1 tags that are styled with the class football info. And you know it gives us like Manchester place today which is correct. And uh, we could also do doc select h1. So in this case this will be a, a list um, of elements. So then we have to work our way through that list and then we can output all of the h1 elements that are in that list. So we're selecting all of the tags on the page, all of the h1 tags on the page here. And so here we get the output here. So the third example I'm going to give you um, is where we have um, sort of, we want to, in this example, we want to pull out the, just this bit of data here called a bit cloudy. Now this is a tricky example because we're actually applying three separate um, CSS classes um, to this uh, tag, to this particular paragraph. So we're applying three separate CSS classes, and with, when you've got spaces like this, um, that means you've got um, three separate classes, and these separate classes might be defined in separate CSS files. So in a big website, maybe you've got multiple CSS files, and so when you look at it in the browser, in the inspection tools, you'll see that it's got these three classes, but, but these three classes might be in three separate files. And they're separated by spaces, right? They're not commas. They're not like they're not um, applying, you know, separately or whatever. It's like the, all three classes have to apply to it. So to extract this data using JSOP, one way of doing this—I mean, there may be a super clever way of combining it into a single select statement—but one way to do this is we can just work our way systematically through the different classes. We can first get all the tags that are styled with uh, the class element weather. Then within that, we can look for the tags that are styled with the class current. And then we can look within this second collection for the tags that have the class conditions. I'm not saying this is the perfect or best way, but I'm just trying to show you how you can make multiple selection statements as well. So here's my sort of little JSOP example. So first we select all the elements that are styled with weather, and that gives us the weather elements. Then we select the ones that are styled with current, giving us the current weather elements. And then we select the ones that are styled with conditions. And remember, these selections are all being applied in sequence. So we're getting the weather elements, then we're selecting within those elements, weather elements the ones styled with current, and then we're selecting within within those current weather elements the ones that start with conditions. So by doing it in this sequence, we can then pull out just the exact um, class that we want, and it works. Right, we get a bit cloudy. So if we look at the original data here, so we're first selecting. I can't remember which order we did it, but we can sort of we run a selection on that, and that gives us probably these two, whatever, and then we run a selection on. Well, weather wouldn't really help. Well, we run weather, weather first, I think, is that right? And then we run current, and then we run conditions, something like that. And so we can pick out the exact bit of data. As I said, there may be some better way of doing it, but this, this kind of works. And I also wanted to show you that you can do these things in, in a particular sequence. Okay, so I've showed you how you can use the selections just JSOP and CSS selectors to pull different bits of data from the page. Now I can show you how you can actually pull data from a real web page um, using the URL rather than just these sort of slightly contrived examples. They're all files. So the general way in which you want to do this is to first you need to understand how the website works, right? It will have a particular URL pattern um, that's used to control, you know, which particular data is returned. There'll be a kind of path structure and logic and then there'll also be a kind of query string structure and logic, yeah? So before you even start with the scraping, you need to figure out how the website works. And a good way to do that is use developer tools in Chrome or Firefox. 
Oh, sorry. So we figure out the URL pattern. Once we've figured out the URL pattern, we then need to find out what selectors are going to pull the data that we need to get. So we usually use the developer tools. Um, we use Control Shift I, fish around the page, look for the classes or structure um, or elements or whatever, to, so we can find out where the data is. Then we can write some code in JSOOP that will download the HTML and extract the data. So first thing is figure out the URL patterns. I'm just using GET as my example here. Probably in your projects you're going to be using GET. I'll mention post briefly a little bit later. So with GET, you can send a GET request to the URL, and then by modifying the path on the query string, you can change the data that's returned by the website. So these are the examples. So here you have like ASDA, so we've got groceriesasda.com. So search cornflakes, or ebay.com, and then search toys. In both of these cases, the path um, contains the actual query that we're going to search for here, because we've got the search, and then at the end of the search path, we've got another bit of the path called cornflakes, which is our search item query time. And then the same with uh, eBay, right? We've got SCH search, and at the end of that, we've got toys. We did search dots, you know, laptops. We'd run a different kind of search on eBay. Whereas other websites, um, they have a different way of organizing the query string, right? Organizing the, um, the, the URL. We've got the sort of search path, and then we've got a query string here, query string here and then we've got a sort of key value pair specifying that entry equals cornflakes. So in this case, it's going to search for cornflakes because entry is like the search query term. And here we got the Marks and Spencer thing as well. We've got the search path query string, and here Q stands for query, I suppose, and cornflakes there is the actual query that's going to be returned. So we could search for, I don't know, grapes on Marks and Spencer's if we replace cornflakes with grapes here. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, let's go back in here. So here's the Asda one. So if we do search cornflakes, it's returned all the cornflakes. If we do Asda search grapes, um, then it returns on a good day, um, all the grapes, right? So by modifying the path here in a specific way, in a way that's specific to Asda's website, I can change what the data that's returned by the website. And the same going to Ocado, right? So if we go for cornflakes here, let's get rid of that for a moment. Um, that gives us the cornflakes. And here we've got the query string here, question mark entry is cornflakes. And again, if we do query mark entry equals, you know, grapes, um, then we get all the grapes, right? So we need to understand how the URL works for the particular website so that we can automatically scrape different categories of products from that website. So we've now figured out the URL, how the URL works for the website. Now we can look for the HTML tags and start to think about, you know, what uh, CSS selectors we need to apply to get the actual data that we want. So we need to look at the HTML, look at the classes and so on and so forth, and figure out how we can actually pull out the data. And with the developer tools, it's kind of easy. We click here, we select the piece of data we want to extract, and then we fish around in the HTML to find out which classes or which tags are being applied to the little bits of data that we actually want to pull out from the website. So again, I'll go back to, let's go back to cornflakes. I feel comfortable with cornflakes somehow. Okay, so here's the cornflakes. Um, and we want to scrape this cornflake data, let's say. Uh, you can get a job there, right? Um, so we do the selection thing. We pull out, figure out which bit of the page we want to, yeah, that was it. Uh, that's it, I think. Yep, so we've got a kind of content wrapper. So probably there's like a list or some kind of sequence of these content wrappers containing each of these different bits of content. But, you know, it's a sort of bit of a fiddle of trying to figure it out, right? So, so there we've got somewhere in here, we've probably got what we want. Right, so here we've got, that's the price data we want, which is held within some kind of complicated promo thing. And then we've got, uh, I don't really want the offer probably. Let's just see, for content maybe, yeah, there we go. So this is probably a piece of data we're gonna want, right? Which is held in the class FOP description, yeah? So if we did a CSS selector on FOP description, on a good day, we might find, um, this, this cornflake data here, the title, the description of the thing, and, you know, the weight, which might be useful. And if we're trying to find the price, uh, well, the price is there, so it's probably, that's price there, that's where the price is. Um, they've got some sort of slightly funny stuff there, right? So probably in this span anyway, has actually got the price that we could use here, okay? So you can see we can actually look at the class the classes and then maybe the tags, although so many divs probably not very useful. And as I said, document traversal here would be an absolute total nightmare. But probably um, FOP description is going to give us something useful. And maybe we can do catch weight or something like that to pick out the, the weight of the product. 
So we figure out the HTML tags, and then we actually now we can actually write some code. Now our first guess at um, what will work is probably going to be wrong. So we write some code, we look at the data we get, and then we write some more code or fix our code um, until we actually get the exact bits of data that we want. So I'll show you how you can do this. So I said first we need to. So for each different website, you can have different ways in which you build the URL for a particular query. So this might be something in our database here. We have the item name we want to scrape. So we're working through all the items that we want to up-to-date prices for. Um, so this will probably come from the database. And then we sort of build our URL, knowing the rules that we've just worked out. And then once we've done that, we can, uh, oh yeah, so this is what's so it's building the URL, and we're calling get on that URL. So JSIP will just do that for us, just as easily as it loaded stuff from files. And then we get this document that corresponds to that um, Ocado web page. Then we can run our selection on it. So I think it turns out that FOP's item is the wrapper that contains each of the products. It's wrapping each of the products like a div with FOP's item on it. And then we work through, so we get a, a list probably of all the different, um, all the products, or all the ones that are wrapped with FOP's item. And then we can fish out the description, we can fish out the price, and we can fish out the final price and the weight. And I'm, I'm just outputting it to the command line there. So this mostly worked, and I'll explain why it didn't fully work, but it mostly worked. We've got some stuff here that plausibly corresponds to the data that was on the page that we just looked at. And obviously, one other thing you're going to have to do, which I'm showing you here, is handle pagination. That's also That will almost certainly be encoded in the URL string as well. So when you click on next, there'll be like some kind of query string there. Uh, anyway, so this is the output, but this output has some problems, yeah? So if you look at this output, it's currently pulling a load of promotional products, right? Because you coffee people, there's like a, you know, some kind of fairly basic marketing algorithm going on there, figuring out that if you eat cornflakes, you probably want coffee with your cornflakes. It's trying to promote you to buy some coffee at the same time. And if you look at the bottom here, we've got like a cornflake cake, we've got cornflake mix, whatever that is, um, and we've even got a book on cornflakes, yeah? So we've got irrelevant data that we'd have to filter out somehow. We've also got missing prices. So because of the way I've scraped it, it's just not getting all the prices for some reason, so we should have to fix that. Um, so what we really need to do to get rid of these problems is fix the CSS selectors, and we might also have to use some kind of string processing maybe to look for a serial in the product description or something like that to get rid of the promotional products or whatever. Or maybe the promotional products have a different... Um, They've probably got some slightly different styling to make them stand out as promotional products. If we can figure out what that is, then we can get rid of, um, then we can eliminate them from the search. So there's only an example, um, and um, you know you've obviously got to spend more time fixing it and making it good. Yeah. So some websites process date search requests using POST. So some airline websites work this way. If you sure you EasyJet or Ryanair, you fill in the form and then it posts it, and then you know you get the data returned. Um, so JSUP can handle that. Um, so all you do is JSUP connect to the website here, and then you add some data, like if you needed to log in, for example, be, and then you do dot .post. The tricky thing here is that some websites um, that use post have hidden form fields. So unless you know exactly what those form fields are, unless, and they may change all the time, you just don't know. Um, so you obviously need to get the, the hidden form fields right here as well, or the post request won't work. And I'm guessing this is pure guesswork um, that Skyscanner and Compare the Market use this approach. So Skyscanner is comparing flight prices. So unless the airlines are cooperating, which is possible or also possible not, then Skyscanner has got to sort of do posting um, of the data that you, you know, flight data, you know, that you want to go from Lisbon to London or whatever. It's got to post that data to Ryanair and post that data to EasyJet and then scrape the results to the return. So Compare the Market may or may not use this approach. It depends how cooperative the companies are that you're scraping the data, right? So Compare the Market could use post, right? You fill in this complicated form saying how you want to, you know, for like specifying uh, all your details for an insurance application, for example. Then Compare the Market can then post that form on another website, scrape the results, and then display them back to you in its price comparison thing. But um, it may have be using APIs of some of these insurance companies to make all that process easier. Now, JSOAP only downloads HTML, so it sends a GET request, gets some HTML back, and that's it. You know, it's not executing any of the JavaScript on a page. And some pages are, you know, single page web applications, or they've got a lot of dynamic content. And if you want to scrape those pages, um, the actual final DOM um, will only occur um, when you've actually executed the JavaScript, which might be contacting web services and so on. So one way to handle that is to use a headless browser. So you could use Selenium to run a headless version of Chrome. There's various other options out there. 
you know, you'd have to be, it will take you more time to do this. And I wouldn't recommend it for Corsair at one, but you know, you can, you can do it if you feel that, you know, your project depends on it. But talk to me first, I think, if you're thinking about using headless browsers. So with Maven, it's dead easy to use JSOOP. So I could have given you the jar file, but decided against it. You can download the jar file, but remember there's marks for using Maven to build your project. So if you've got JSOOP in your project, I'm expecting you to use Maven. And quite frankly, um, it just makes it really easy. Yeah? You just bung this in your Maven build, in your POM XML, and then it'll just download the, the jar file automatically, and you don't have to do anything else. And you can even package it in your application if you want. Right, so, there are some warnings and some important things you need to think about um, when you're doing web scraping on, for your project. So the, this is like a, a, a sort of functional warning, if you like. So websites change all the time, okay? As I said, if they redesign the website, they're gonna change all the class names, change the DOM, um, you know, the developer could rename FOP description to FOP catch rate and so on. So if your code depends on these class names being present, your code will break. So the code in your project will break if your website changes. So the way you handle this, if you've got a commercial company like Price Runner or something that depends on price comparison, then obviously you're going to have to write some unit tests or functional tests with Selenium that check um, that you know the website is working as you expect it to work and it hasn't been changed. In your projects, um, you're not going to lose any marks if the website changes between submission and demonstration. So I'm expecting you to manage to get the way scraping code working, you know, when you submit the project, yeah. I mean, if it breaks in the last couple of days, that's okay, I understand. But you, so you've got to have got your data from the website and you've got plenty of time to do that. But if your website scraping code breaks over Christmas because they redesign the website, re release a new version, um, then it's absolutely fine. Um, I'm not going to penalize you for that. There's also legal issues concerned with web scraping. So software, and it's a bit of a gray area, okay? So software is used all the time to pull data from websites. So Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Go, whatever, they're crawling the web constantly, constantly pulling data um, from other websites, and they're making money from the data that they're pulling, right? Google makes a whole shed load of money from crawling other people's websites. And it even got its price comparison website based on all that kind of data. But web scraping may be against the terms of service of some websites. They might say, we don't want you to scrape our data, or they may have restrictions on how you use the scraped data from their website. It's a bit of a legal gray area. So I'm not saying this guy's totally right, but he seems to have some sensible advice um, about you know, some of the potential issues you might encounter when scraping websites and crawling websites. So um, yeah, so don't take this as, you know, absolute truth. He says himself, he's a lawyer and he probably don't believe what you believe in websites. Um, but I think it's a sensible starting point for thinking about the legal issues to do with this. So when you're doing web scraping, particularly if you're going to base your project on it, you should read the website's terms of service. Now, where some websites not, might not have a terms of service, in which case it doesn't really matter, yeah? But other websites will have a terms of service. Um, and you should read them. And if it says, you know, we'll prosecute you and, you know, send you to prison for 20 years if you scrape any of our data, then probably that's not a good website to choose for your project. Um, now, most websites will have a, a file called robots text, which I'll explain in a little bit, which specifies which parts of the website it's okay to scrape and which are not okay to scrape. Another good, useful, you know, rule to follow is that use a reasonable crawl rate. So the website administrator is going to get kind of upset if you're sort of hammering um, their, their website, you know, with thousands of requests per second, yeah? So maybe, so in your code, you're going to be using threads for writing your web scraping code. So just, you know, send your thread to sleep every few seconds, do, do a quest, go to sleep, do a quest, go to sleep, go to, do a quest, go to sleep. Yeah, there should be no problem pulling enough data from your project by pulling data at that kind of rate. And that way you're not, ham you know, using up in an, un you know, unnecessarily using up the resources of the website that you're taking the data from. It's probably a good idea, um, not necessarily essential, but a good idea to identify your web scraper with a legitimate user agent string. So you can specify, you know, the user agent um, at the end of, um, let's just quickly, uh, here, you can specify the user agent string when you're connecting to the website. And, you know, typically that'll be like the name of the browser you're using, um, but it could also be, but you can also put other stuff in there. You could just say, I'm in the string, I'm, you know, a student at Middlesex University and, I, and I'm scraping and I'm pulling your data for this particular project or whatever and, you know, explain what you're doing and why. That's not a bad idea. Provide a link, you can even link to a page explaining what you're doing. Um, but in general, if the terms of service of the robot, robot's text prevent you from crawling or scraping, then it might be worth asking permission. They probably ignore you, and maybe it'd be better just to look for a website that's got a bit more, you know, uh, a bit less uptight about their people pulling data from them. 
And a really good rule to follow is don't republish scraped data. So probably the website won't care if you pull some data from it using web scraping or whatever for your student project, okay? It's not harming anyone. You're learning how to use a set of tools and that's all good. But if you, you know, for example, hoover up an enormous database of Facebook data, let's say, and stick it on the web, then Facebook's going to come after you, okay? So don't republish it for your student project. Keep it on a personal drive or whatever, and, and I think it'll be okay. So robust text um, is at the sort of root of uh, a domain if they're kind of worried about scraping. And it basically informs the web crawlers about which areas of the website should not be processed. Um, so, you know, look at, the, sort of look at a couple of examples. Um, so here we've got Facebook. So Facebook does not like you scraping their data, which is fair enough, right? Because it contains a lot of personal stuff. So they're saying calling Facebook's prohibited unless you express written permission. If you want to access Facebook, they've got their own API with Facebook Graph and all that if you're doing it for a project or something. And you can even read the terms of service or whatever there. So recommend, so don't even bother trying to scrape a site that says that because they're obviously not into you scraping it at all. And then if you look at the user robots text, they'll specify the user agent. So here you could put your own user agent when you're specifying the get request you can specify your own user agent so if you're apple bot or whatever you're disallowed from all this stuff disallowed from this stuff, blah, blah, blah. and then it does allow some user agents to access certain things so like bing bot for example that's a web scraper right it'll let you it'll let bing access that stuff right and it'll let you know whatever slurp whatever that is you know access that stuff yeah but facebook's pretty draconian because you know obviously it's very sensitive about personal data so i did check ocado because i was using it as an example and so it's disallowing all of the stuff, all of the mobile path and the web and the web shop, all the web shop paths. So probably, I'm just guessing here, um, that if you're logged into a cardo, um, then you'll end up with like on a, on a web shop path, and then you're not allowed to like pull this stuff. So I'm guessing that it's preventing um, like an automatic shopping application, so that it would actually purchase products for you on your behalf. Um, but on the path that I was looking at, right, so we've got Ocado.search entry cornflakes, right? It's not actually banning, you know, any user agents. So this is, applies to all user agents that star there. It's not actually banning anyone from doing a bit of scraping on the search path. And then I also took a look at the terms of service here. So it's all sort of set up fairly clear. So if we've got use, use of the website. So it's a little bit ambiguous. So on one hand, it says section 4.6, you may only scrape the website on the basis that by doing so, you're putting us permitting us to scrape any website owned or controlled by you. So that's okay. So that's kind of friendly, right? They're saying you can scrape this website, but we're going to scrape you back. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, in section 4.1, so this is where the ambiguity comes in. You can retrieve and display the content on the website on a computer screen, store such content in electronic form on disk, but not on any server or other storage device connected network or bloody, bloody, blah. So which is also fine, yeah? Because in your projects, you're just gonna be storing it on a disk. You're not gonna make your projects publicly available with the Ocado data and so on and so forth. So probably, so I think it's probably fine scraping that particular part of the website. Um, and, you know, if we made it publicly available, we might have to clarify what that made, what that meant. Um, um, and maybe that would just be covered by this stuff anyway, that it'd be fine if we built our own price comparison website and then they could scrape our price comparison website back, something like that, yeah? So with Ocado, I think it would be okay. And you should be, when you're thinking about um, the data you're going to use for your projects, this is the kind of check you should be doing. Right, so it's robust text. Righty-ho, so course work one, you need some data, right? Otherwise you can't build your website. Well, you can, but you have to do it manually and you'd lose, you know, 10, 20 marks if you don't get some data from uh, somewhere. So we have a uh, download, so we've got web scraping marks. I'm going to give you some marks for getting some web scraping working, but obviously if you're only getting from a single website, it's going to be a bit of a lame uh, price comparison website. What I'm really expecting you to do is download data from five or more websites, yeah? And then the data itself, in terms of the web scraping, I'm expecting you to get more than a thousand rows. So that means you're going to have to scrape multiple different kinds of products, probably, from multiple websites, yeah? And you're not allowed to manually enter the data. If you want these two marks, you can, you can produce a website based on manually entered data, but you're going to lose these two marks and lose the marks of web scraping. And I showed you the problems with getting the data from Ocado, that the data is generally a bit of a mess. So you have to, I'm giving you a couple of marks for processing it, eliminating duplicates, irre irrelevant text, missing fields, and so on and so forth. So example codes available on the course website, uh, along with a few resources, there weren't that many resources this week, along with the lecture, recorded lecture as usual and that kind of stuff. And just to wrap it all up, so this lecture has explained how you can download data from third-party websites uh, using JSOUP, and the next lecture will be on RESTful web services.